very good opportunity for everyone can join and you can have a, a good discussion on a design from the participant from globally we can <laughs> interact with each other so today we have a very wonderful speaker with us uh, welcome again karen uh, always pleasure discussing with you and talking with you uh, karen was uh, on season 1 also she was our speaker and thanks again given us a time for community and uh, for today's wonderful topic about design thinking and Okay, so a little bit just uh, introduction about uh, Karen. So Karen is like, uh, she's a bank, she's the banker and she was a vice president. Sometimes I think almost 13 years is a vice president in the Bank of America. She's a very strong investor or advisor. And then she now doing a, she's like a life coach. She's a, uh, giving as a corporate session a part of uh, universities uh, she's have own platform so i will share link Uh, detailed program about design thinking. So we'll talk later at the end of this session. So to connect with link, uh, Karen on LinkedIn, and I already shared her uh, platform. So yeah, over to Karen without wasting time. So we can start today's session. Wonderful. Well, thank you to Char for having me. Um, I'm always excited when a connection a year ago continue. And, uh, grow. And so I'm just really grateful for this opportunity to talk to everyone about the Unlock the Gold Works. As I was uh, exploring leadership and how design thinking can be used by leaders to solve any of the problems that they are facing today. Sorry to interrupt. There is an echo in our voice. Yeah, I think uh, there is a, but uh, I think it's a slight delay. Uh, uh, can I please continue because try to slowly so maybe i think some issue in the voice is there so yeah okay Hopefully yeah. the echo uh, will. Please pay attention. Uh, yeah. yeah. Please continue. All right. Well, welcome to uh, Unlock the Gold Workshop. Workshop. Together in this workshop, we're going to unlock DEI for teams with the power of leading by design. Leading by design is what I call using the innovative principles of design thinking for leadership. Yeah. So where does so where this journey does start? Journey start?
organization. So um, I think what's happened in leadership as a historic historically is that leaders have seen employee experience and profits and the goals of the organization as mutually exclusive events. Um, obviously, through the pandemic and what's been going on in the world, they are becoming aware that these two are not mutually exclusive, but they are intricately interconnected. And so while they understand the money where their mouth is, but how do leaders who know that this is important, like yourselves, uh, begin to implement this, even if you don't have the financial support of your organization? It is quite possible with design thinking, and we'll show you how that is today. So this is where the journey is going to be taking us. We're going to introduce you guys are my design team. We're going to have a mock uh, design project here, just a snippet of design thinking and how it can uh, impact DEI. We're going to. These are phase one of design thinking, and then we're going to unpack how that achieve DEI, and then we're going to open it up to questions. So let's get started. Um, how many people do we have on the phone, Tashar? Uh, on phone, I think few people. Uh, all are at the Okay. All right. Well, let's, we have a few minutes. I want to go around the room. Give me your name. Uh, the title or nature of your work, and then what makes you a unique asset to your team? So, um, Dinesh, would you like to start? Uh, yes, ma'am. I am a student right now and learning UX. Uh... Actually, they want um, just okay. basic things. So, so you um, have a unique talent for identifying the needs of your customers and showing them what it is they want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thanks for being a part of today's session. Is it uh, Utnam? Utam? Hi, uh, hi, Karen. This is Uttam here. So uh, I'm currently working at in Toyota oh. Every. Uh, so say my, that again. I'm, We're... I'm currently working at Toyota Every. Okay. Yeah, it's a Finland-based company. Wonderful. Yeah. And what? Quickly understanding the, their pain points, I'm coming up with a lot of ideas in the graphic uh, perspective. Wonderful. Yeah. I love that. So yeah. you take their pain points and you um, turn it into creative graphics. Yeah, creative graphics. Yes. So that is my unique. Uh, Wonderful. Yeah. I love it. Thank well, you. welcome. And who's next? I'm sorry, I don't have a whole list of names here because I'm sharing my screen, but. I can't call on everyone by name, but who else would like to share your name, the title of or nature of your work and what makes you a unique asset to your team? Hi, Karen. My name is Bilal Kazi. I. and providing that to So you're a salesman? Kind of. Uh, wonderful. 
delightful. So um, I love that because a key part of any position, really, whether you're strictly sales or you're in leadership, is the selling of your ideas, uh, the selling of goals. Uh, there is not a section of our life that sales does not impact, even though we may not have the title of salesman. But I love that, that you are able to upsell and meet the needs of your clients. Thank you for sharing. Who else would like to share your? And I'm working as a UX designer there. And what makes me unique is that uh, I really can communicate with uh, our clients uh, very easily. And then I can uh, brief my own team about it. Uh, and it really works very well. Wonderful. So, Rakib, um, your unique asset to the team is communication. Yeah, communication. You obviously are a good listener from the client's perspective to understand their needs, but then you're also a good communicator for translating those needs to your team and how they can put together the solution for the client. Yeah. Uh, I'm working as a senior UX designer uh, for a fintech domain uh, in Dubai. Uh, uh, my unique asset to team is I am a quick solution provider and a user researcher, as well as uh, doing user interface designer and interaction designer. Mm. So research is a, a key part of uh, your unique asset and one that fits very well design thinking, you know, most people think of research today as, you know, online or, or different resources, but our user experience interviews are also research. Really, anytime we are learning something new about a situation. Um, my name is Allison. I'm a career changer. Um, and in my previous job, I had to analyze equipment, come up with a repair plan, and then get a team together. And I guess my unique skill is my viewpoint and the fact that um, I've been sent to do jobs I'm not qualified to do. And the last person that sent me said, I'm good under pressure and I don't make rash decisions. So I think that's oh, one of my wonderful. skills. And then I was getting invited invited to meetings, even though I wasn't the technical expert, because the way I think, because I always think of the something else, right? Like I'm a, I'm a different viewpoint, so they wouldn't miss everything. Yeah. Allison, it sounds like but considered outside of the room. Um, and that's a great asset to have. And one that will serve you well as you journey through using design thinking, um, because that is, that is a key that everyone on this call, especially if you have aspirations to use design thinking, must begin to unlock because it is opening up to all those perspectives, yours and everyone on your teams and your clients. Uh, that's really going to bring you the, the most innovative and uh, the most effective solutions for whatever the problem is you're trying to solve. So thank you for sharing, Alice. And anyone else before we go on? Okay, then. Uh, let's, let's align our definitions of diversity, equity, inclusion. So I, I want to hear from you what is... What do you feel diversity is? And then I, I will put uh, up what our working definition for this workshop today is. So, um, 
Allison or Nalish or Utnam, Dinesh, anyone on the line? What what do you think of when you think of diversity? I like different different people, different uh, planet, different uh, animals. Like we can differentiate it. Okay, so uh, diversity. I would like to um, diversity. Sorry, go on. Uh, diversity, just to recap what was just said, diversity um, highlights differences. And I saw Allison and Big Cab yeah, were Allison, about to say Allison. something. Yeah. Yeah. I, it might be my bias, but I like, for me, diversity is different perspectives. Like, I like a different viewpoint. I always want other people to. I want people to tell me something I don't know, right? Like, so I want to be with a bunch of people where I don't hear the same thing all the time. Wonderful. I love that different perspective. That is definitely the case and perspective is not something visible. I know a lot of times when we think of diversity, we think of what we see on the outside and, and having, you know, different genders, different races, different cultures, all the externals, but. Diversity is more than just the externals, just as we are more than our external bodies and and brains. It, it's the perspectives in the room. So thank you for adding that, Allison. Who else? What is diversity to you? Yeah, that's right, ma'am. We can say the situation and the conditions of the person could be as a diversity because everybody thinks according to their situation and uh, what actually they are feeling when they are using something or they are working on anything. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. You know, everyone that we meet has a different life experience, has a different uh, pursuit of passions in their life. You know, everything about them is unique up until that point and different from us. So there is something to be learned from everyone. Um, so for today's session, just to sum up what we're going to use as a definition for diversity. Uh, diversity is the need for employees to have their voices heard. So what you talked about there is everyone's unique perspective, everyone's unique experience, um, in, which includes, you know, how they've experienced the world as a male or female or uh, other gender, how they've experienced the world through their upbringing, their education, their previous work environments. But all that experience and all that perspective um, is really kind of thrown out the window if we don't allow them to have their voices heard. And so for the purposes of this presentation, diversity is about the needs of the employees to have their voices heard. So next up is equity. Um, so chime in here as to when you think of equity, what do you think of? We think of, think of shit. Yeah, please one by one. Equity so for me is come for the share market. First, I think for that one, but it is a different uh, word here. So, who would like to share what they believe equity is? Yeah, uh, I can share. Sure. Please go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, equity means uh, providing the people what actually they need. It's Apart from equality, uh, giving everyone the same thing is not the right answer. So we provide everyone what actually they need. What's like uh, when we are talking about a disabled person, they have a different kind of problems. They have different pain points, how they interact with things. And this is all about, according to me, equality. Mm, I love that, Dinesh. Well, and a key point you mentioned there, it's not the same as equality. It's not about treating everyone equally. It's about uh, meeting their needs. And um, for the purposes of our presentation today, equity is the need of employees to be treated fairly and with respect. So 
as Dinesh mentioned, you know, if you have a handicap employee, the, their needs and how to treat them with respect and fairly is going to be different than uh, someone who does not have the same handicap. So it's really just respecting everyone for who they are and then treating them accordingly and fairly. Um, it's not about treating everyone equally because uh, based on, again, that person's experience, their their um, abilities, they're going to need to be treated differently than perhaps someone else. And it's not that we treat one better than the other, but that we treat them fairly and with respect. So what is inclusion? Who would like to share what is inclusion? I would say in this case, it's diverse. Mm. Okay, so making sure they're included. Uh, to me, inclusion is something like uh, receiving the diversity, uh, the perspectiveness of that uh, diversity. Okay, so it is it is it's kind of diversity in in action is what you're saying, Rakeem. Yeah, yeah, diversity is in action. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else on what is inclusion? So inclusion is about how well the contributions and presents and perspectives of the different groups. Uh, so of the people are valued are integrated into an environment. So I feel this. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. So for the purpose of our presentation today, inclusion is the need of employees to feel they belong and they can bring their unique gifts. So a little tweak or difference from diversity, diversity being the need for employees to have their voices heard, um, equity being the need to be treated fairly and with respect, inclusion being the need to feel they belong. So we can, you know, if you think about it in, in contrast to diversity, we can listen to our employees, but if we then, you know, discount what they have to say or dismiss them um, or or not um, accept them in any way, then they don't feel included. They don't feel they belong. And so inclusion takes diversity one step further. It doesn't just listen to their voices and let them be heard, but it also makes them feel that they belong, even if maybe their voices and their unique opinions and ideas and perspectives are different than others. It doesn't make them feel like they're an outsider. It also goes beyond their voice to looking at their unique talents and gifts and allowing them to bring those to the table, which I find when dealing with employers and their employees, this is probably the most untapped potential there is in the workforce today is that, you know, we pigeonhole our employees in a particular job with specific tasks and we fail to look at all the unique gifts and talents they have that could actually not only enhance the work they do that we've given them and we've told them how to do it, but it would also enhance uh, the customer experience. It would enhance, enhance uh, the team's performance as well as the organization's performance. Um, and it's this tapping into this unique gifts that really transforms the performance gold. So with these three things in mind, I want you to begin as we, especially when we get to the mock design part to think about how is what I'm doing, which I'll have a volunteer at that point, how is what I'm doing uh, touching on all three of these things? And I think it'll be clear to you to see that design thinking in and of itself as a process is a powerful tool to accomplish all three of these. So, um, what is the evidence that DEI is being achieved? So, if, you know, you are visiting a new organization or you're on a new team and, um, you know, what is the evidence that this is happening? 
What kind of things do you see, feel, experience when um, DEI is being achieved? Is it that they, you know, pro are big proponents of DEI and they preach it from the rooftops or, or what is the evidence that it's being achieved? This one's a little hard to um, measure, right? Because to do it truly, um, <clears throat> each individual feels it, right? Like this would be more of like when you're in the company, you have um, like psychological, political safety, right? So right. it's almost unmeasurable. And the only things that you can measure may or may not actually give you DEI. Yeah, I, I love what you said there about it's a felt experience. And, you know, that is, feelings are one thing that has been I guess, ignored in our society and in business for a long time. And uh, the pandemic just magnified that sense of the need to feel something and to feel something more positive than what had been felt before. But I agree with you, Allison, this is a felt experience. Um, but some evidence of it, in my opinion, would be, you know, when I feel like I'm heard, when I feel like I belong, when I feel like you got my my company is using my unique gifts and talents, uh, there's a couple things besides feeling great about it. Um, I'm more engaged. I'm more productive. I'm happier to come to work because I feel like I'm living out my purpose, what I was put on this planet for, because I'm bringing my unique gifts and talents to um, the table. Uh, you know, I'm. I feel respected. Respect obviously is a feeling, but there is evidence in how I show up and how I perform when DEI is achieved. And so from a leader's perspective, retention, engagement, um, turnover, uh, the, me the meeting and exceeding of goals, all those things are evidence that DEI is being achieved because when when you have an individual employee that can check off those boxes, they can feel that they're heard, they can feel that they're uh, fair, treated fairly and respectively, they feel that they belong and that their gifts and talents are appreciated and encouraged and welcomed, then all those things are accelerated. So what is the link between DEI and design thinking? Would anyone care to guess? We have a lot of UX design thinking uh, types on the call. What would you think is the link between DEI and design thinking? Anyone? Is it more of a systems approach? You look at the flows and make sure that um, it's usable for everyone, so it's equitable. Um, it it does definitely have a systems approach to it, and um, that obviously can make DEI more tangible than I think it is in some instances. Uh, that is a subsidiary of it. It's, it's more of a um, outcome than an input, but I think it's a good, good distinction to make, Allison. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else care to guess what the link between DEI and design thinking are? If you notice those three definitions I gave, the need for employees to have their voices heard, the need for employees to be treated fairly and with respect, and the need of employees to feel they belong and can bring their unique gifts. The link is the human need. DEI is about the needs of the employee. And design thinking is about meeting needs. Design thinking 
uh, and this or this uh, definition comes from IDEO, a leading design thinking firm. Design thinking is a human centered approach to innovation anchored in understanding the user's needs, rapid prototype generating of creative ideas that will transform the way organizations develop products, services, processes, and how their users experience the organizations. And we'll talk about the history of it in a minute, but design thinking has always been about the, the needs of the human. And in this case, we are now a pro, uh, applying design thinking to the needs of the humans that are our employees and those needs being DEI. So the link between the two is it's about meeting the needs of the human, specifically the needs of our employees. So, uh, and I won't go too much into this because I think we have a lot of design thinkers on the line, but um, the golden circle of design thinking, if any of you are familiar with Simon Sinek, uh, start with the why he has this golden circle. And so uh, the what of design thinking is, is it's a creative problem solving technique. Um, and it involves, you know, a leader, obviously, of a design team, the design team itself, the user, um, the the resources, both financial and human resources of the company. So there's all these pieces involved in the what of design thinking. The how, which we'll highlight in a minute, is the five steps of the process, empathy being phase one, define the problem phase two, ideation phase three, prototyping phase four, and testing page, page five. But the why of design thinking is always about improving whether it be a product a service or an experience um, and doing that in a way that meets the needs of the humans so it's not really about the organization and their needs but it's about the people they serve um, so how does design thinking work i kind of highlighted these five phases but and we won't go into all of them but in our mock design we will uh, really give you kind of a bird's eye view of the empathy phase with an employee, which I'll need a volunteer. So uh, hopefully one of you guys will step up to the challenge for that. But obviously design thinking in and of itself is it's, you know, there are degrees in design thinking now, so we won't be able to un unlock all of these or unpack all of these today. But uh, Tushar will talk about an opportunity we'll have for everyone here to to take part in learning about design thinking as a leadership practice uh, starting in January. So ev evolution of design thinking real quick. Uh, in the industrial age, that was when, you know, we had the factories and the and the assembly lines. And so it was all about creating, you know, whatever the latest widget was, you know, design thinking was always applied to product, meaning you know, here is how to make this product or here is how to make this product better. As a leadership practice, um, leaders were command and control. I, the leaders had already figured out how to do this, what the most effective way to do this was, what the goal was. And so they were really uh, commanding and controlling their employees to get these things as fast as they could about out of the assembly line. In the information age, we kind of shifted from a, a product-based society to uh, a service society. So pro, um, design thinking transformed from just being a way to improve products to a way to develop services and a way to improve services. In this instance, leadership uh, shifted. It went from command and control to more of a coaching approach. Leaders knew what the goal was um, for the organization, but, you know, the path could vary, you know, based on how a person uh, thought or problem solved or whatever, the path to the goal was different. So the leader took a more coaching role and they coached their employees across the finish line based on, you know, various routes to uh, getting to the goal. Now we're in the experience age. And we've moved beyond just the product and the service, but we've moved to, you know, how do we want our customers and now how do we want our employees 
to experience our organization. And the goal is, is not as concrete as it was in the industrial age and the information age. And as we experienced in the pandemic, sometimes the goal is different depending on the week or the day because of the constant change that is happening in our world. So our goal isn't as clear cut as it used to be. And certainly the path to get to that goal isn't as clear cut. So the leader is evolving yet again, because now it's not just command and control. We can no longer do that. It's ineffective for most of what leaders face today. It's more than coaching because it's not just coaching them towards a goal because the goal is changing. It's more about designing. How do we design an experience that engages our customers, engages our employees, and uh, helps us reach the, the performance goals of our organization? So leadership uh, now and going forward is more about designing, designing solutions, designing experiences, uh, designing connection, uh, designing ways that we can feel that we belong and are a part of something bigger than ourselves. It, it's really moved beyond coaching. Now, there are still instances where command and control is effective. There are fewer than they ever have been, but there's still a few. There's still a lot of need for coaching, but increasingly the need to design solutions that are going to meet the needs of all parties is increasing. And uh, that's evident by this research from Gartner. Uh, the C-suite's pursuit of design thinking is growing exponentially. It's up 174%. And the reason I believe this is, is because design thinking is a creative solving process, right? And if you look at what's on this list of this Gartner research about the emerging C-suite soft skills, strategic management, adaptability, complaint management, data governance, customer satisfaction, sales skills, customer relations, sales leadership, and demand planning, all those things that fall below design thinking are actually problems to be solved, right? Uh, we have to solve issues with our customer relations. We have to solve issues with sales skills and sales leadership. All those things are things that, that need innovating. And design thinking, the reasons it's at the top is it's like a superpower for giving us the process and the tools to tackle all those other issues that leaders face today. Um, and another, just to share why are they, this is another reason I believe that executives are attracted to design thinking is that design led firms and the list, there's a list of them there that are design centric, Apple, Coca-Cola, Ford, Herman Miller, and so forth. Part of the reason why executives are so drawn to design, design thinking is also because it outperforms the S&P by 228%. So what is it that can help me solve all my problems, but also help me uh, perform my organization perform at its best? So it's really attracting a lot of leaders these days. And here's another reason why. This is a top 10 skills as of needed for 2025. This is uh, documented by the World Economic Forum. And if you look at everything on this list, design thinking, because of the nature of the process, checks off almost all of these. Um, it allows it, it, by practicing the process of design thinking, we're improving our analytical thinking and our innovation. We're uh, improving active learning and learning strategies. We're obviously complex problem solving, we're critical thinking and analysis. All these things that the World Economic Forum says are the skills of the future are practiced when we are going through the process of design thinking. So it's a powerful tool for leaders. So right now, now I wanna to get to our mock design project and I'll need a volunteer for this. 
And I'm just going to go through the empathy phase and we're going to make up a, a goal and um, we're going to uh, talk about that goal. I'm going to be a new manager. I'm going to be a manager who has been a leader for decades, but may not really know a lot about what's going on or the work that my team does. Um, so I'm going to show you how through the empathy phase, I can learn and navigate how to move my team forward to achieving the goals, but also to accomplishing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So uh, who would like to be my volunteer? I can be the volunteer. Not everyone. All right, Allison, thank you. And um, Allison, tell me again your, your current role. We'll kind of tie it to what you do now. Um, currently, I'm unemployed, um, but previously, okay. I was an application engineer, which okay. I guess in my company's title was an engineer that was applied everywhere. So, I, okay. All right. Um, and so, what would a, a typical goal be for you as a application engineer? Um, basically, I had. I would find out the customer's true needs because a lot of times they would tell me they have this problem, but it's not what the real, it was a symptom, not the issue. Mm -hmm. And so I would troubleshoot yeah. that and then try and uh, rally my company around um, solving it. And so I could do it theoretically or, you know, like the unit is still together. So we don't really see what it is. Or um, in our busy mm -hmm. season, I would go to um, power plants and disposition the equipment and um, find all the issues and then coach the customer on what to choose based on their operating profile. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's, let's choose a common goal that um, your leader would have for your team. Um, I think the overall goal would be bookings, right? So we'd have um, the pr problem is um, you have a lofty financial goal and since it's not mm -hmm. um, clear cut, you don't know if you're going to make it. So part of my job would be go to these outages to find extra work in order to make that um, financial goal a reality. Okay. All right. So um, financial goals, I would imagine that is something everyone can relate to on the call here. Yes. Yes. No. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I'm going to be Allison's new leader. She's going to love it because I know nothing about engineering or or the things she talked about here. But I do have a lot of leadership experience and and I'm equipped with design thinking. So um, you know I'm going to come in here and begin the design thinking process. Allison is one of you know, several on my team. So this conversation that I'm going to have with Allison is just a snapshot of the empathy phase of design thinking. But imagine that I'm not only having this conversation with Allison, but I'm also having it with each of Allison's teammates. So um, Allison, um, I'm going to just go ahead and uh, start the conversation here as I would have it as a new leader. And um, then you can respond as you would to say your say your boss previously. But I want to talk about, you know, as a as a team, Allison, we have some pretty lofty financial goals, and uh, you know, I'm coming in here as a new leader, and I certainly uh, know very little about uh, the work you guys do. But I'm so impressed by the talents and gifts that you bring to this team as well as everyone else on this team. And so I think that uh, regardless of my knowledge that I have the right team here to really not only meet these financial goals, but exceed them. Um, if we can tune into, you know, your unique gifts and talents and what you bring to the table and what you know about our customers, then I believe we can really design uh, a winning, um, atmosphere here that 
kind of blows the doors off these financial goals and really shows um, upper management, you know, what, what you guys are capable of and what we are capable of. Now, I will say up front that, you know, I, I don't necessarily have a budget uh, for the ideas that may come out of this, but I do have the opportunity to talk with senior leaders about it and see, you know, what can be done. But from a creativity standpoint, constraints uh, help us to be more creative. So I don't want you to hold back any of your thoughts or ideas because we don't have a budget or I'm not able to change any systems here. But I do want you to understand going forward that maybe not all ideas will be, um, you know, pursued because of those constraints. But I do still think there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of untapped potential here. And that's why I'm talking to you today. So I want to thank you for having this conversation with me. So, Allison, um, when you think about our financial goals, and uh, your your uh, perspective on the team. Can you tell me uh, what's been working well in the past with previous leaders? Um, is understanding that uncertainty is a huge issue in our company and also the customers company, right? Like they have, um, they don't know what they're going to find until they open the unit, right? And it makes their upper management uncomfortable. And as you know, it makes our upper management very uncomfortable because you can't actually plan what you're going to do. So one of our strengths is having technical people available to be there on site and coach them through that. So that's one less thing they have to think about because you're already planning to be there at the key moment and you're giving mm -hmm. them an unsolicited bid, right? So it's another option. Um, to them instead of just their open and close group. So they don't have to mm -hmm. then search for somebody to do it. And if we if we lead with our technical strengths, um, that even if we don't typically charge for that service, um, that adds value to the overall customer relationship. Mm. So what I hear you saying as far as what's working uh, with our team right now is one that that we are kind of a calm, calming presence in in an uncertain situation for our clients. Um, so just our presence in these scenarios where they're looking into their problems, um, having us there is very, very calming, very grounding for them, very assuring for the clients. Yeah, because you have to have the right person go because you're separating the noise, right? There's a, they're going to find a lot of things wrong, but they don't have to mm -hmm. fix everything, right? So they can start um, deciding based on how they run the unit, what's most important to them. And then they can okay. put um, the, the nice to haves on the list for the next outage. Right? Because everybody's mm. got bu budget and time constraints. So um, what we do or what we try to do is go and optimize all of that. Okay, so another key strength of our team and what our organization does for our clients, besides being that peace in the storm, is also um, kind of a point of discernment and wisdom in sorting out what's urgent, what's not urgent, what's important, what's not important, uh, what can wait. So it's really kind of a sorting out of things for them. Is that correct? Yes. All right. So we have peace that we bring to them. We have discernment and technical expertise. Is there anything else you see as an organization, as a team that we are doing extremely well with our customers and, and that helps us achieve these financial goals better? Um, I think when we track outages, so we know what's coming next so we know how to prioritize our time um, and we can have sales and technical people start coaching them about what to think about right when you're you know a year out you want to start thinking about who's going to open the unit when you're six months out you want to start thinking about you know what are you going to do if you need parts right so it's mm. sort of um, aligning our sales process 
and our tech technical expertise to be another resource to them because they're um, obviously everyone's downsizing, right? So their core engineering group or their maintenance group or any of a lot of resources have been um, retired out and given the package. So now a lot of the technical deciders are um, doesn't have as much experience as they should. And they're used to relying yeah. on a technical group that was highly encouraged to retire. Yeah. Uh, this is excellent, Allison. Thanks for sharing. Cause I, I love that we can bring the peace and the calm and uncertainty. I love, you know, obviously we have a lot of technical strength and insight and wisdom, but we're also bringing another important piece in that strategy. We're not only helping them face whatever the issues are of today, but we're helping them plan out for the future. And that's, you know, strategy and timing and planning are, are key uh, skills needed in any organization. And to kind of supplement or support our clients in that way, I think is very important. So I love this. And it, as you, you know, continue to ponder this question, what are our strengths? that are going to help us achieve these financial goals. If you think of anything else, you know, my door is open, but I really think we have a lot here that we can maximize on. Um, but let's shift now to talking about, okay, what's, what's not working or what's missing um, on our team or in our organization that perhaps is a hindrance for reaching those financial goals. Can you, can you talk about that for a bit? Sure. Um, we've had new management come up in the upper levels and they're not used to uncertainty as much as the previous managers. <clears throat> so they tend to, um, you're going to feel this, they're going to give you a lot of pressure to guarantee certain numbers that you can't. And they're, mm -hmm. um, they're moving the focus away from where it needs to be um, onto other things that have worked in other industries but aren't really applicable to our, our business model. So uh, what I hear you saying is, is uh, there's a tendency by management to uh, be driven by fear. Yes, a little bit. I mean, it's just, they're not used to this level of uncertainty. So they're trying to run okay. a playbook you know, that they used at a previous company. So like GE is the OEM, they build the turbines and their name is on the side and we're aftermarket. So they don't call us first, right? So if you're, what, what works at GE is not going to work here because we have to be more creative and, and engage the customer more instead of waiting for them to come to us. Right. Right, we we don't have the sales power of GE. We have to uh, sell our on our own strengths and and gifts and talents and abilities. I get that. Um, what else do you feel is is something that's missing or something that's not working very well for our team or or organization as a whole? Um, <clears throat> the uh, the shops are not able to perform the way they used to. Um, part of it is um, they've understaffed the shop in California and the shop in Houston is having massive process problems. So their quality okay. is greatly reduced and their um, their time has increased. So it's everything you don't want in the aftermarket. It's uh, poor quality and long lead times. Mm. And because yeah, and that, of that, that costs, is... yeah, costs have gone up. So then you raise your prices. So your competitiveness has plummeted. So it's really kind of a, a problem that leaks from one thing to the next, from the staffing in a, in a shop to lead times, to pricing, to customer delivery, which is impacted. Yes, so it's, a the, whole, it's a whole quagmire. Change. And to let you know, they're going to be calling me from time to time to go in and save them from themselves. Mm. Wow. That must be extremely frustrating for you. 
Um, a little bit, but um, usually I get them headed in the right direction before I have to leave to do something else. Yeah. Uh, frustrating in that you see the solution to the problem, but also very rewarding in that you are able to go in and really take care of the customer and get them back on the right track. Yes. Okay. Um, anything else that you think is missing or, or could be improved in, in how we achieve our financial goals? Um, I think just aligning everybody, like getting <clears throat> sales to track the outages and to call in technical people, you know, and plan, you know, help realize that we're not selling widgets or repairs, we're, we're selling a customer solution, right? They have a need that yeah. we're selling. <clears throat> and we get to be more creative yeah. doing it than GE because um, whatever they do gets viewed over all the units that they have of the same type. Yeah. So, I, you know, you've given me some really good um, thoughts about this, you know, our system here, our organization, and how it flows, you know, I really appreciate the education as a new leader here coming in, you know, knowing that, you know, obviously I'm not an executive in the company, so I'm limited in the amount of obviously budget dollars I can um, allot as well as influence and systems. But I don't see those constraints as necessarily a hindrance, but a doorway to creativity. So knowing that those uh, constraints are there, Allison, what um, what ideas do you have for for you know improving or innovating our team and the work that we do within those constraints? Um, I think it's m the most important thing if you want to get booked to bill is tracking the outages and being able to plan to have somebody on site <clears throat> at the right okay. moment because that's your best that's your best opportunity to make a sale. Otherwise, it's all theoretical, right? Because they can mm, open the unit okay. and nothing is you, we um, our help, our industry. You can have POs canceled on you because they don't need the work done. Mm. Right. So you've had the best price, you've had the best delivery, but they open it and say, yeah, we don't need it. Um, mm. <clears throat> and you've already had it on so your it's, back. It's, so really tracking, uh, tracking the outages is kind of our sales pre predictor here that we have access to. But I'm assuming you're saying that the previous leadership was not doing that effectively. They got away from it. They went to, um, they felt like um, they could almost sell it like an iPhone, which you can't. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, people who have been in the industry can tell you based on the outage length and the unit size, how much money you can mm -hmm. expect to get out of that in repairs. If the, right. if the customer has money allocated, right? And it's not a lot right. of extra, the salespeople are already talking to the customers about that and mm -hmm. our sales force has a place for that and you can actually mm. run campaigns off that information and you know you can track it um like a d11 has certain design flaws that we have technical repairs for so that's when you uh -huh. can start you know you can start coaching the customer like hey what are you going to do if your n2 box has a crack in it right oh uh, yeah Okay, so uh, I love this because uh, on some level we're returning to basics, but then uh, and focusing on the basics, but then we can build innovations from there, right? Right. Um, so, so, and uh, for lack for you know time in this conversation, we'll assume that Allison has given me a number of. Uh, ideas about how to track the basics, how to uh, track the systems, and then how to also turn that into sales. But Allison, you know, you've given me all this wonderful information, and I want to, once I've talked to all your other teammates, begin to implement this 
as our focus, <clears throat> excuse me. I want to implement this as our focus. Um, and I want to add those innovative ideas of how we can turn that tracking of the basics into um, a better client experience and innovations in the services we provide them. Of all the things that you've shared with me, and, and we're going to assume that you've shared a lot more than you have, Allison. You know, what about those changes excites you? Um, what gifts and talents do you think perhaps are untapped that uh, you would really like to use to kind of make this, this plan come to life? I like solving the customer problem, right? I always say we're in the business of making happy turbines because then the customer's happy and then the sales guy is happy. Um, and my sure. unique skill is I'm able to find um, physical flaws that nobody else can see. Like I can see cracks and mm -hmm. covers and other things. And um, so I can direct the NDE people to look there or pay special attention so I can find issues that could cause catastrophic failure failure faster mm, okay and then we get paid to fix them so then everybody's happy all right well okay super you know now that i know uh kind of your your ideas on on what the issues are what's working and what's not working and really where you're going to add the most value and 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 where you bring energy and excitement to to the work. Uh, you know, I'm going to keep collecting this same type of information from the rest of your teammates. And uh, then once we've talked to everyone, we're going to get together to really define the problem. We're going to narrow down these things. Uh, to what the consensus of the team is, as well as, you know, kind of what the priorities for tackling first are. And then we're going to get to get to work on implementing the ideas, letting you run with the things that you're strong with and really pulling all these pieces together, because, you know, I think you bring some unique gifts and talents to to not only our team, but the organization, but these financial goals that we've been struggling with as a team. So I just want to thank you for your time and um, I'm excited about where this is headed. Thank you for your time. All right. Okay, so that's just kind of a snapshot and uh, of, of what an empathy interview would be with an employee. And as uh, I mentioned in the last part, I would have this type of conversation with each employee on my team. And that would that would be phase one of design thinking, the empathy phase. Um, so let's talk about having listened to that conversation about how I would address uh, the financial goals of this team with each of the employees how did that project address the need for dei this is where everyone can chime in allison obviously you can share your experience as the employee that was interviewed but for those that were observing you know if this conversation was had with you as an employee how would you feel um, since obviously DEI is a felt experience, but also how, how did it address the needs? The need for employees to have their voices heard, the need for employees to be fairly treated fairly and with respect, and also the need for employees to feel they belong and they bring their unique gifts and talents. Don't everyone volunteer at once? Anyone want to add? Please go ahead. Allison, let's start with you. What was your experience? Um, it was very good. I like the framing back and you know the um, UX interviewing skill. Basically, what I hear you saying is and stuff like that. So it would hit the inclusion because you you want to know what I think or what I hear. And um, 
it hits the diversity because you wanted to find out what my unique skill was and how it could be applied. Um, and then mm -hmm. it probably, there probably would have been an equity phase if I was really <laughs> your employee, right? Like you would have asked me more no. specific questions about either the work environment or something um, to make sure my unique needs were met. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? How did it, how did, um, did the conversation allow Allison's voice to be heard? Yes or no? I think the answer is yes, but I don't know what you guys are observing from your end. Uh, sorry, actually, I'm not getting the right point, but yes, you can say it because you asked everything, whatever uh, you need to know about the team and the problems they are suffering or they are having right now. So, you yeah. Have, um, so, uh, basically, I don't know. I don't have the right words to explain the things. Yeah, but I'm asking the questions and I'm listening. So. I'm allowing the voices to be heard. And this this conversation was obviously maybe 10 minutes where normally when I'm dealing with with a a team and a, a goal or a new initiative, you know, this conversation may be 30 minutes, could be an hour. It could uh, could take place, you know, on a weekly basis. Uh, it's really an ongoing thing. This was just kind of a one-time kickoff as I was her new manager. But yeah, we're always tuning in to, to our employees, asking them with this vision in mind, you know, what's working, what's not working, how can we make it better? And, and really what part do you want to play in making it better? Um, the employees need for to be treated fairly and with respect. Did, did we check that one off the box? Did I treat Allison fair and with respect? Yeah. Yeah, you treated her well and tried to understand her perspective for everything. And you didn't blame yeah. anything for uh, anyone for anything. You just tries to get the and what actually she wants to say. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, when we're doing these user interviews with our employees, it's really about accepting and listening and seeking understanding. It's not about judgment, which obviously violates equity because we, when we judge others, we're not respecting them and we're not treating them fairly, but it's really about just gaining understanding and gaining perspective. Um, we may have our judgments, but we don't want to project those onto our employees. Um, we really are seeking in this phase to understand um, and understand things perhaps that are different than our own on ideas and perspectives. So we checked off the equity box inclusion, the need for employees to feel they belong and can bring their unique gifts and talents. Now, obviously we're in the first phase of design thinking. So I really haven't you know, allowed Allison to use her unique gifts yet, but I, I hope that I portrayed to you that that is part of the process going forward, that when we get to the define the problem and the ideation phase, we're really gonna tap into uh, what Allison says she's uniquely gifted for, which for her was perspective and seeing things that other people don't see. Uh, we really want to hone in when we get to the ideation, prototyping, and testing, letting Allison do more of that because that's what she's good at. That's what comes to her as a natural skill and talent. She, it's, it's innate in her. That's going to make her work more effortless because she's, she's just naturally good at that. It's not something she has to struggle to do. It's easy. It comes easy for her. And so by allowing her to bring that strength to the team more and more, then that's gonna increase her sense of belonging 
and her her sense of purpose because she's you know kind of fulfilling what she was created for what uh what comes uniquely natural for her and that happens with each teammate because other teammates are not going to have that that keen eye perhaps that allison has um so that checks inclusion off the box too um, and all that equates i can tell you from my experience into increased performance i've seen teams come from the bottom of their uh, peers to the top 10 percent of their peers i've seen them go from you know zero in financial goals to surpassing all of them and winning trips and company awards and all sorts of things all because they've designed an experience that not just works for the customer but works for the employee as well. So I'm gonna wrap it up right now with final questions and answers for you as to how this process plays out or you know, what's next for you as a leader looking to implement design thinking as a leadership practice. But I'll open it now to questions. Um, to Shar, obviously I can't see the chat, so if questions have come up in the chat, be sure and bring those in right now. But what questions do you have? Uh, so please go ahead. Uh, you can ask question directly, or you can use chat box. Uh, I think before we start, I think uh, I think just uh, let me thank Alison. I think she's very uh, gracefully she has contributed as a track. Uh, also, I'm thank Ricky, uh, Uttam, and Dinesh. They also actively participate. Uh, I hope uh, uh, because I always say design thinking is not about uh, solving design problems. It is about solving business problems with the design process. Mm -hmm. So hope uh, today's session will at least bust the some myths about design thinking. It is a and thanks, Karen, that you have covered it very well. Uh, so before we move on, yeah. please, uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. Please. Please don't hesitate to ask your question if you're thinking it, someone else is thinking it. So, there are no dumb questions. Yeah. I have a few questions if I can take this opportunity. Okay. Um, maybe that yes. while uh, people will start thinking. Uh, so yes, um, definitely what uh, you talk about is the DI and design thinking, but you know how you no, how you think that you know how our industry is itself is uh, ready for these processes and where we are lacking and you know because so far design thinking is on surface for quite quite few years but still uh you know why industry is not uh, or where you see there is a gap in this thing why what what do I see is the gap between the usefulness of design thinking and its application? Yes. Is that yes. your question? Yes. yes. Um, you know, design thinking has a wonderful history. As we talked about, it's been used since the industrial age through the tech, you know, the information age and into the experience age. What I think is is um happening and it's an evolution is that we're going from the external to the internal so we have you know taken what we could see touch and feel products services customers uh, and things that are very tangible that applied design thinking to things that are not as tangible you know someone's gifts and talents how they feel about their work and all those things are very intangible that we know they exist, but we just have don't see how to get our hands around them and, and to manipulate them like we would products or, or work with them. So I think it's just a matter of uh, companies embracing the fact that what is um, works well in the external can also work well in the internal. You know, any gap between where something is and where where we believe it should be that gap is experience 
and education. So, you know, Tashar, what you do here at UX Training Labs and what ADP List does, you know, you are closing that gap. Um, the gap's going to exist until more people, um, once they've tried everything and nothing is working, then they they open up to, okay, if we can design a product or we can design a service, then surely we can design an experience that taps into the potential of our employees. I think that the education of it and the experience of it, which is what we wanted to deliver in, in the class that we're going to offer in January, is really what's, get, what's going to begin to close that gap. Definitely. Yes. Uh, yeah, Sims uh, <laughs> all are overwhelmed with the design. I think there is no questions. Uh, but yes, before we close, uh, as uh, Karen also mentioned, and I also mentioned in the very beginning that uh, today you just saw one process that you now empathy and how we can uh, use this process to uh, show the empathy with your uh, all stakeholders. Uh, so similarly, there are all five processes in a design thinking. So in January, uh, we are coming with a very detailed workshop. Uh, you know, because I know in one hour uh, we cannot cover entire uh, because design thinking is it has to be activity based and everything. Uh, so in January we are coming with a very uh, action packed uh, workshop, and Karen is uh, is there. Uh, so, please do connect with uh, me on a LinkedIn and Karen also. So, soon I'm probably in a couple few days we announce date also. Uh, so, stay tuned. Uh, design thinking is uh, one of the highest uh, profession nowadays on hiring also. A uh, lot of industries are applying design thinking process in there as a uh, as a development process or product development process. So definitely it has a very future and bright uh, opportunity. And design student, uh, UX professionals, definitely uh, they can go for design thinking. They can make wonder in their careers. And yeah, hopefully. Thanks once again, Karen. Uh, it is always a pleasure yeah. uh, uh, discussing with you and uh, I know it is early morning uh, and it is like for you, it is uh, morning. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for participation and stay tuned for our next UX talk. Uh, probably we have one or two UX talk lined up, but then after that, uh, I'm taking pause on UX talk. So probably in season four, uh, I will start after this January our workshop. Uh, yes, so do connect with us. Uh, on the LinkedIn, Twitter, all platform. Karen is also very active everywhere. Uh, I already share our website that uh, design for innovation.com. Uh, thanks again for weekdays time. I know uh, you must be tired of uh, work and then you join this session. Uh, thanks again. Yes. Uh, uh, good night and good day for Karen. Good night all. Thank you for being a part of the group. I look forward to uh, you guys coming and learning more about this process and how uh, it can really unlock the performance gold for your team and your organization in January. Any questions, uh, feel free to email me or connect with me on LinkedIn. It's been a pleasure serving you guys tonight. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Thanks, Karen. Thank you all.